Amen, amen. Start with a story. It all started in a garden, amen? amen? And there were some trees there. Do you remember those trees? There were all kinds of trees with all kinds of fruit on them, but there was only one tree they couldn't have. And then that's the one they went right for, because <laughs> that's the way that we are. Yeah. And so when they went for the tree, it wasn't because they were hungry. They had food everywhere else, but I got to have that tree. And, and there was just this moment, and, and, and some of you guys know all about this, but that tree, it wasn't just that God's a mean God. It was the fact that that tree brought the knowledge of good and evil. It brought the knowledge of good and evil because that's not what God wanted for humanity. There's so much when, we're, when we read the Bible, we've got to remember that there was an original plan, and what we're living today is not the plan. What we're living today is a broken version of the plan. God's original plan was that we would be innocent of evil, never having experienced it. And so often, we feel like we've got to get in there and experience it. Have you ever met a teenager before? <laughs> Have you ever met a teenager who's talking to you and they can't wait to get out there and just experience all the experiences. Because, man, if they could just experience all the stuff, because you've been holding them back for so long, but if they could just experience all the stuff, man, they'd be an adult now. And, man, it'd be great now. And you're sitting back there, and you're like, oh, I wish I could save you from all that. I wish I could protect you from the experiences that are going to bring darkness and pain sadness into your life. Man, I wish I could protect you from that. Can you imagine that exponentially from God the Father to humanity as he looks at Eve and Adam and says, don't touch the tree. It's going to kill you. And so that's how it sets up. And of course, the serpent comes and you know the story. And the serpent comes and the serpent's got a test for her and a temptation for her. And how does it go? He's like a master fisherman. Do we have any fishermen in the audience today? He's like a master fisherman. And he, he, he's got the perfect bait. And then he's going to bring that right up in front of her mouth. And what's the bait? The bait is that he comes to Eve and he says, first... God didn't really say this. You won't really die. And what's he doing there? He's hiding the hook. I used to fish with my dad, and sometimes I'd be putting the bait on the hook, and I'd leave a little bit of silver visible. You ever do that? Left a little bit of silver on that hook. And my dad would look at me and say, Josh, you left a little bit of silver. I can see it. And if I can see it, the fish can see it. And he was competitive. So he's like, you go right ahead and do that. I'll catch all the fish today. <laughs> So I learned Satan's hiding the hook because that thing's going to bite. What he says to her is he comes and says, God doesn't want you to have this knowledge of good and evil because that's something God has and that's part of what makes God awesome. And Eve, God doesn't want you to be awesome. God wants you to be insignificant. He doesn't want you to matter and if you want to matter the way that God matters, you're going to have to take it into your own hands, Eve. You're going to have to take this thing that he's holding back from you because you can't trust him. You've got to take it on your own. And she buys right into that. and She just chomps right down on that hook. And Adam, we don't even get the story about Adam. We just know he took it next. <laughs> Maybe he was an even easier sell than Eve was. I don't know. But they both take it and all of a sudden, all this darkness and poison comes into humanity. And do you see what she was doing there? She was saying, I'm not going to do this God's way. I'm going to matter in my way. And it's independence. And it's not trust. It's trust in myself. And isn't that the way we've been living ever since? is at the end of the day, I trust me. It's the reason that we get caught up in religion, even in church. Because we even come to church and we don't believe the gospel that it's free. We don't believe that the work's been done for us by Jesus on the cross. Instead, I've got to make it happen. Because it's so instilled in us. I have to be independent. 
I have to be in control. So fast forward thousands of years, and then you get to Jesus, and everything gets better. Amen? Amen. Good, good. Everything gets better. This is Matthew 4, verse 1. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. Now this right here, this is the sequel to Eve. This is like you've seen the movie. Now here comes the second movie where everything gets better, right? Jesus is about to get tempted. He's about to face a very similar test to what Eve faced. And notice who led him there. The Spirit did. God led him. Now, God is not going to tempt him. We're going to deal with that later in the book of James. God's not going to tempt him, but God's going to lead him into that place where temptation will happen. Because it's the will of God that Jesus would be tempted this way, partly because he is our example. So Satan steps up, and he gives him three tests. And I'm only going to tell you about the last one. But if you know the story, Satan comes up to him and says, I want you to bow down to me and worship me. And if you do, Jesus, I'm going to give you all the broken people in the world. Now, that's some great bait isn't it? Why? Because Satan knows what Jesus is here for. Satan knows Jesus has come to save all these people, and he loves all these people, and he's on a rescue mission already for all these people. But he also knows the only way forward for Jesus is a cross, and that's going to be painful. And that's going to be a whole lot of suffering. And even some of you guys know about the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus goes to the Father and says, is there any other way to save them? Let this cup pass from me. And he still takes it on. But do you hear the emotion in Jesus? See, Satan knew that that was there. And so Satan comes and says, hey, I'm going to give you what you want. How about the ends justify the means? I'm going to give you what you want. How about you matter in my way, not necessarily God's way? Why does it matter, Jesus? You're going to get what you want. See him hiding the hook? It's what he does. It's how the test goes. Jesus says, if I'm going to matter, I'm going to matter God's way. And this is the verse. He says in chapter 4, verse 10, he says, get out of here, Satan. Satan. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And what he says there is, I'll only do it God's way. I'm going to do it God's way, and I'm going to get God's results. And he undoes what Eve had done. He's called the second Adam in scripture. Jesus passed the test. So there's your two pictures of two different tests And they went two different ways. Now let's go into our passage today, which is Matthew 6, 9 through 13. This is the Lord's Prayer. And we've been in the Lord's Prayer this whole series long. And you're going to see how all this connects in just one second. Would you read this with me right now? Because this is a big deal in churches that we read the Lord's Prayer. Amen? Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Some of you grew up saying this prayer. We've been talking all throughout this series that this prayer is not just a prayer to memorize, although that's a great place to start. But we believe that Jesus intended this prayer like an outline or like a template for your prayers, that you would use this. And for each phrase, what that represents is a way to pray. So there's a section on there of your request where you say, Jesus, give me all the daily bread that I need. Everything. Here's all my requests to you. Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I depend on you. Jesus, I want your will to be done instead of my will to be done. Jesus, Forgive me for all the things that I've done wrong. And then, Lord, would you please lead me not into temptation? And that's today's verse. Lead me not into temptation. 
but deliver me from the evil one. That's a big one. So we've already asked him to forgive our sins. But this is the moment where we stop and say, but I've got other things that I still struggle with. So Father, would you protect me from the tests? Right? Some of you wish you could use that in high school. Father, protect me from all the tests. Right? It's an interesting prayer. It's an interesting, it's, it's probably the most mysterious phrase in the entire passage to me. Why would you ask God to protect you from the time of testing? Because sometimes God does lead us into the time of testing. Now, some of you have noticed already that the word there is temptation. Let me tell you what the Greek word is. It's called parasmos. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. Parasmos. And that word in the original Greek can mean temptation, but it can also mean testing or evaluation or even trial. And so your, your translators made it temptation here. I don't think it is temptation. Why? Because I don't think God ever leads us into temptation to sin. I think God brings us to the testing place, but I don't think God ever tempts us to sin. And I'm going to prove it to you. Here's James chapter 1. Verse 12, it says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. And when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Do you see it? God doesn't tempt anyone. Verse 14, we're going to keep going, but each person is tempted. How does it work? When they are dragged away by their own evil desire and entice. What James is saying here is, guess who tempts you? You tempt you. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, it gives birth to death. Now, if you're watching closely, you may have noticed that's a bit of a sexual metaphor that James just gave us there. He talks about enticement. The actual word is seduction. He says you're seduced. So here's how it flows according to James. Number one, you get seduced. You want it and you tempt you. Number two, conception. The desire grows inside of you the more that you feed that desire. Have you ever done that before? Have you ever had a bad desire and then you fed the bad desire and the desire gets a whole lot bigger? That's conception. And then third, it gives birth to a sinful action. And then number four, it has a grandbaby called death. So if we could on the slides, could you go back to the previous slide on the uh, scripture there real quick? Do you see it? He says, you're seduced by you, then conception happens, then it gives birth to a sinful action, and then the death in your life comes, the destruction, the darkness into your life. So here's my illustration. I love the cheesy goodness of Doritos chips. You can amen that. Why do I love the cheesy goodness of Doritos chips? Because I have a fallen sinful belly. That's why. And taste buds. And so that's where I start, right? Like I start with the desire that is in me. And then what do I do next? Well, I stare at the bag of Doritos chips and I open the bag and smell it. And as I do those things, I haven't, I haven't eaten them yet. But I've taken steps, have I not? To, to increase the goodness and the desire of it. And then what happens? Well, then my out-of-control desire gives birth to me eating the entire bag of Doritos potato chips. And all of those empty calories are now in my belly, and they have a grand baby. Amen? <laughs> they have a, right, right there. <sighs> this is why God cares about sin. Because he loves us. And the sin that we choose to enter into, it has a Doritos grandbaby. It's, it goes by a lot of different names. But we bring darkness into our lives, do we not? We bring poison into our lives. 
And then later on, we wonder what in the world happened. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. So what's he, he hitting you with really quick? He's talking about temptation, the temptations you face. And first just says, hey, don't think that the temptations you face are outlandish or crazy or unique to you. They're not. So don't get into that place because you could fall into self-pity if you go into that place. Right? So, so gird up and realize that this is common. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Now, let me just say quickly before we move on. He does not say that God will give, won't give you anything you can't handle. People will say that in the church sometimes. That's not true. God will give you lots of things that you can't handle. But God will be there with you to help you handle them. Sometimes we look at the things in our life and we're like, God, I can't handle this on my own. Yep. You're going to need him. And so how is he going to help you with your temptation? But when you are tempted, it says, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. God will also always provide a way out for you, and he'll be communicating that way out to you in the moment. You're like, well, how have I missed it? Were you looking for it? Because a lot of times I'm not looking for it. Like, why did I buy the Doritos in the first place? Why are there five bags in my house right now? <laughs> but don't we do this? There's so many times that I've been in a moment, and man, it's been, it's been so hard to fight the particular temptation that I'm facing. And then I'll start to pray, and I'll say, God, you promised in your word that there would be a way out. God, would you show me what the way out is right now? Because I don't see what it is. And man, he reveals it. Whenever I ask, he reveals it. He'll show me what it is and then run for it. Run for it. Okay, before we go any further talking about temptation and sin, I just got to acknowledge something. You start talking about sin in the church, and here's, here's where people immediately go. We go to our religious experience where people have beat on us and said, darn it, you all need to clean up your lives. You need to get better. You need to work harder for Jesus. Because if you could just clean up your lives, we could have a cleaner church and a prettier church. So get with the program. That's crapola, is it not? That's a whole lot of junk. So many people are like, God's all about the morality. And he's all, all about the list of rules for you, the rights and the wrongs. And God wants to limit your pleasures in this life because he's a pleasureless God. And he's kind of ticked that you're having so much fun. <laughs> like to shut that down. And whenever you come against God and you do one of the things on his list, man, he's going to bring some bad stuff into your life. We say these things as if God is a vengeful God. And all of that is wrong. He is not a vengeful God. And he does not bring things into your life in order to, no. Jesus Christ died for you. He died for you and he atoned for your sin so that you would not have to atone for your own sin. Don't self-atone, it's no fun. I, I love that, that Taylor, our worship pastor, she, she was talking to us this morning during communion. And did you hear what she said? She talked about the veil that was between God and us. Did you hear what she said? She said that when Jesus died, the veil was destroyed. And so there's no longer any separation between God and us. And what struck me in first service is I was sitting there listening to her. And I'm like, I remember when I was a kid in the church and we took communion. And I was taught how to take communion on a, on a, on a wood pew. And I was told that I was supposed to confess my sins from the week before I took the communion. And that was so destructive to me. And I know that there maybe is a bit of a seed of truth maybe in there somewhere. But here's what that practice communicated to me as a kid. Was that Jesus might have died for me. But every time I sin, that veil goes right back up between me and God. And I better manage that separation. Because as soon as I cross him, God's mad at me again. As soon as I cross him, God's mad at me again. 
and I better do some penance, and I better deal with it, and I better avoid that sin in the future, darn it, because I don't want God mad at me. And that's not amazing grace. That's not that at all. Jesus died for sins, the scripture says, once for all. Once for all. Everything I've done in the past and in the present and in the future, he knows all of that. It's all been paid for. It's been atoned for. He already paid the price. Why would he ask me to pay it again? And it is not my sins that will send me to hell. No. (laughs) I'm messing with you now, right? It is not my sin that will send me to hell. I have sinned and Jesus has paid for my sin. The only question is whether or not I will surrender my life to Jesus Christ. What will you do with Jesus? That is the only question as far as your eternal security is involved. When when Jesus talks about the sheep and the goats, he he does not go and say, it is your sins that cast you into hell. He says, I never knew you. Some of them he knew and some of them he didn't know. He's like, do we have a relationship or not? Because if we have a relationship, then I've atoned for your sins. That's actually how it works. So we got to cover this because if we're going to talk about temptation and talk about sin today, we have to know what's actually going on. It's not your salvation that's in question. You are saved and you are secure. And I pray that you live like a reckless child of God because I live like a reckless child of God. I take chances in the kingdom. I get my neck out there right? And I might sin and I might screw up. Who cares? There's a net underneath me. I get forgiven. I'm loved by Jesus, which means I can take risks. Does that make sense this morning? His love and his grace wraps around my life. It fuels me. And that's what it's supposed to do for you. So why in the world then are we talking about sin and temptation? Because when we give in to sin, it brings poison into our life. Not that threatens your salvation, but it brings poison into your daily life. And it brings poison into your relationships. It brings poison into your mental health. It brings poison into your emotional health. And it impacts the glory of God in your life. And that's why we're talking about it today. In 1983 in Bangladesh... The World Health Organization was called to that area because people were coming into the doctor and they had these really weird lesions on their feet and they were becoming more and more common and they came in to investigate and what they found out was that arsenic was in their drinking water in that whole area. It, It had impacted 50 million people in that area. The WHO called it the worst environmental disaster in human history. Because arsenic, the way that they were doing the wells and stuff in that area, everybody was drinking arsenic in their water. And these lesions were just the beginning. And every single time they drank it, more arsenic came in and they were poisoned more. And this was all leading to various kinds of cancer and ultimately death. And they were able to come in and mitigate the problem and deal with it and stop that from happening. This is what we do. See, it's not just that pornography is morally wrong. That's not the point. The point is that it poisons the intimacy in your marriage. That's the point. You can be saved and on your way to heaven, and you can have a poisoned marriage. And God has better things for you. He loves you. Right? It's, it's not just that pornography is wrong. It's even if you're not in a marriage yet, part of what it's doing to you is it's causing you to regularly objectify men and women. You don't see them as people anymore, worthy of respect. It changes you. See, it's not just that, that, that pornography is morally wrong. It's that many of us are giving money to it, and we find ourselves, even as Christians, funding a very dark industry and keeping it alive, and keeping it destroying. And some of our money is, is going right to, to sex traffickers in the world, keeping people in bondage, literally. And this is what we miss. 
See, when we make it about this, this moral list and we don't see what's really at stake here, we make God kind of this ogre instead of somebody who loves us. And he just wants good things for us. It's not just that your addiction is wrong. It's that when you're drunk or you're high, it's the impact to your career. It's the impact to the stability of your family. It's all those things that feel like they're out of control. Those are the things that come into your life that God's concerned about, wants you to be well, wants you to be healthy, wants you to not pass this on to the next generation, wants you to be the one who breaks it. So that's what's at stake, and that's what God wants for you. And those are the obvious things, right? What about the more hidden sins? What about the greed that's in your life? What about the man manipulation? Some of you are manipulating your kids, your grown kids. What about those things in your life? What about the bitterness about your past? What about the Amazon Prime app that's eating away at your checking account? Right? Some of us need some slowdown steps before we hit by. It's become way too easy. Oh, it's so good. I love Amazon Prime. Praise God. So good. But I got to slow it down, you know? What about skipping your Sabbath? What about the, the thing that's inside of us that says, you know, I've got to work got to keep working. I've got to get ahead. I've got to do these things, and we'll never rest. And God came in and said, hey, one day you rest. Why did he do that? Is it to give you a rule? It's not to give you a rule. It's because he, he, he saw American culture coming. He knew what we were going to deal with. He knew the temptations. He knew how much houses were going to cost. He knew all of it. And he knew it was going to be a struggle. And so the poison comes in and he gives us away and says, if you just trust me, if you just trust me and do life my way, I'm going to free you from the poison because our God is good. So all the sins, all of them, I can't list them all out. What's underneath all of them? Can I give you three big things that I think that the pain, the agony that's underneath all three? Let me walk you through these. The very first one is self-protection. This is what we do is we protect ourselves in this life. And so many of our sins, what's underneath it is self-protection. Pastor Ricky talked about this last week. This is so often what's underneath our unforgiveness toward other people is the fact that I have to protect my heart because nobody else will. So I better come in and I better build a brick wall of protection around myself. And I better hold people at arm's length any of, this, any of this sound familiar at all? I better hold people at arm's length. I better not trust because I'm responsible to protect me. And when God comes in and says forgive, he's asking us to trust him instead, that he'll protect us. Well, that's hard. Next is self-gratification. God, I've got needs and I've got wants. And it's houses, and it's boats, and it's sex, and it's money, and it's, it's, it's all kinds of things. These are the things that I want. And God, I don't know that I trust you to provide those things. So even if it's against your will, I'm going to reach out and I'm going to take those things. Self-gratification. Lastly, self-significance. This is back to Eve. God, I have to be impressive. I have to matter. I have to have the degree. I have to have the job title. I have to have these things. Because at the end of the day, I have to know that I'm a significant person. And I'm going to take it to myself, even if you don't give it to me. And it's very hard for me to trust that you've got me in any of these areas. Do you see what's underneath even all of these? It's trust. It's trust. At the end of the day... The root issue in all of our sin is the fact that we struggle to trust God and we've learned to trust ourselves better. I don't let me down, we say. It's a total lie, but it's what we tell ourselves. We struggle to trust God. If we would trust God, 
each of these areas would not have the same hold that they do today. And this is why you have to love. And this is the weird part. Like, I'm going to take a right turn here, right? Like, this is all the weird Christian stuff in church about you've got to love God. You've got to worship him. You've got to read his word. You've got to walk in a relationship with God. Why does any of that weird stuff matter? Because he's the one we don't trust. And we don't trust him because we don't know him. And we don't know him because we haven't put him to the test. And I mean in the good way in our life by depending on him. See, God wants to come into your life. And he wants to be the sun at the center of your universe. He really does. And if you would do that, if you would surrender your life to him and live for him and learn how to walk with him and love him, like this is truly what it's all about, all these areas of testing and struggle would start to make sense to you. So why does God test us? I think the reason God tests us is the same reason your driver's ed teacher tests you. Have you ever seen a driver in Lawton, Oklahoma, and you wish they had been tested more? <laughs> Daily. Daily. <laughs> You're like, oh, no, tests are good. Now that we're talking about this, tests are good. <laughs> and are we glad they test us? Maybe they should have tested more. Sometimes, sometimes the test is helpful for us because what it does is it takes the invisible knowledge, the things that we didn't know before, and now we know. Like, I don't think David knew what was inside of him until Goliath showed up. God allowed that moment to take place, and he took faith that was deep inside of him and invisible to so many around him, and he let it shine. He let it come out, and so many were inspired as a result. Do you see how tests can be good? My daughter, Davy is at Savannah in college right now, and she's doing finals week right now. We just were Amazon priming food to her as we speak. Um, yeah, Doritos for sure. <laughs> Don't tests make you cram for the test? And sometimes when you get tested and you know a test is coming, what you find yourself doing is you find yourself sharpening and leaning into the test. And sometimes that's what we need. Sometimes that's what we need, and God knows it. Sometimes it's this. Sometimes we don't have it on the inside like David did, and we're going to go through a test, and we're not going to do so well. Follow me. We're not going to do so well but it's going to be a warning that this is a weak part of our life that we need to work on. And I would much rather have the warning light on my dashboard than the wheels just fall off all of a sudden. And so God, sometimes in his grace, he brings tests into our life to let us know about us before the wheels fall off. So God tested Jesus. He tested David. He even tested Job. Do you remember him testing Job? He tested Job, and you know what Job's issue was? Job was suffering, and he had no answer as to why. You ever struggle with that? God, I'm suffering, and I'm a relatively good person, God. I don't know why I'm suffering as badly as I am. And he takes it to God in the book of Job, if you've ever read it, and God basically says, I've decided to not answer your question. And Job says, I place my hand over my mouth. I'm unworthy, and I trust you. Oh, that's way too much for us to accept today. By God's grace, someday we will. But there's a reason people have said for millennia, the patience of Job. Because we look up to him, because he was tested, and he passed the test. Okay. So we've established sin and temptation is bad, amen? Amen. Tests can sometimes be good for us. But here's the real twist, and this is what's made this message so difficult for me, is Jesus in the prayer says, God, please don't lead me into temptation. If temptation can be good, why are we praying that God not lead us there? Your brain's okay? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hard. 
Why do we pray it? I think the, the answer to this is that you would ask yourself, what's your kryptonite today? Start there. What's your kryptonite? Your kryptonite's different than mine. All right, what's a temptation for you is not necessarily a temptation for me. Right, we've all got our own little weak areas. Those areas that, man, if it was brought to us just in this particular way, on this particular day, when I've only had this much sleep, man, I'm going to fail every time. What's your kryptonite? I'm going to give you a minute. Ask the Lord. Ask the Lord. What do you struggle with? If you were to look back at the last few months, what's brought the most poison into your life? There's a hymn that was written in 1758. It's called Come Thou Fount. Anybody know that hymn? There's a, there's a verse in there. It's just, I love it. It says, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. I'm prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy, thy courts above. Prone to wonder. God, I'm prone to wonder. Lord, I feel that. I'm prone to leave you, God. You've saved me and done everything for me, but... I keep waking up and I'm prone to walk away from God. And that's my life. Anybody else in here? That's my life. And I don't know how I keep getting to this place, but I keep choosing sin and I keep failing and I keep needing your grace. Oh God, I keep needing your grace. Are you getting it? Oh God, I keep needing you. Oh God, I keep coming to the conclusion that I'm the weak one and you're the strong one. I keep coming to the conclusion that I don't love you nearly as well as you love me. I was talking to somebody a month ago, and they said, I used to, as a kid growing up in church, I used to read the prodigal son, son story and think, man, that's probably for criminals, right? All those really bad people, maybe they're here in church with me. They need to hear about the prodigal son. And they said, you know what? These days, I realize I'm the prodigal every single day. I'm walking away from God all the time. And he's always bringing me back. And he's always running to me and killing the fattened calf. Because we need that. You ever let your gas tank get low in your car? Some of you know exactly how many miles you've got once the light comes on. And you drive your spouse crazy. And you're like, it's okay. I got 20 miles, I got 30 miles, whatever it is, whatever number you made up. And you're like, it's okay, no big deal, right? Even if I'm wrong, I'm just going to drift to the side of the road. Even if I'm wrong. Now, what if you're a helicopter pilot? Do you let it go to E? No. I don't think you do. Because you're not drifting to the side of the road anymore, you're going down. So why, in so many areas of our life, do we let things go to E? You know what we do? Because there's no difference between the car and the helicopter as far as the mechanics of gasoline engines. The difference is the consequences, potential consequences, if you get it wrong. And when it comes to our life, and when it comes to our choices, so often we just don't believe God about the poison that's coming in. And that's maybe part of the point today, is would you believe? Linda and I sometimes fight. I know, hard to believe. <laughs> we sometimes fight and and we get in arguments, and we go distant from each other, and we have a hard time, and it's a hard week in the house, and, and some of you guys know what that's like. And, and, you know, we'll circle back around. We'll talk it through. We'll finally have the conversation. We always let it go on too long, and we'll finally have the conversation. We'll come together, and we'll start unpacking everything. And as we talk through everything, it's almost always the same story. Do you know what happens to us? Here's what happens is like, I'll have a really, really bad week, hard week, feeling beat up by my week, and I'll come home, and I just need somebody to
to rub my feet. I just need somebody to take care of me. I just need somebody to think about my needs more than their needs. I just need, do you hear the self-pity? Just, just for once, couldn't I be the needy person in the house? Just for once. Ah, oh, what dark thoughts we have. And you know what we find out at the end of the conversation, what she's doing? She's like, I've had a really hard week. And you know how it goes. <laughs> and we'll, we'll be there and we'll be laughing at each other like, here we go again. We both had a really hard week, oh God help us, when we both have a really hard week at the same time. And there's a part of you that's just like, Lord, would you protect me from temptation? Lord, would you protect me from this trial? Would you protect my family? God, I'm having a really bad week. Would you protect us? Would you keep us sane? Would you keep us from hurting each other? Would you keep us from saying those things that drag this thing out from a, from a 48-hour trial to a three-week? God, would you protect us? Do you see what Jesus is leading us to here? He's leading us to a very sane prayer. When you pray, really pray, lead us not into temptation. Here's what happens. You get four things. Number one, I'm going to hate the sin that's in my life. The more I pray, God, protect me from this sin, protect me from this poison that's coming my way. If I really know the kryptonite, do you know your kryptonite? And I start praying on a daily basis, God, keep me from it. I start to hate the sin. And that hatred for that sin is good because I'm done with it. It's taken too much from my life already. I'm done with it. So God, increase my hatred for that sin. The next thing is I won't brag about my spiritual strength. Why? Because I'm the prodigal son and I'm prone to wonder. And I know that. And that humility comes into me as I go to Jesus and say, lead me not into temptation. Lead me away from trial. I'm not going to sit here and assume that I can handle it. I'm not going to take it down to E and play like everything's fine. I'm just not going to do it. I get humbled. Next, I won't foolishly drive into temptation if I pray the way the Lord has asked me to pray. I won't foolishly drive into temptation. If I struggle with alcohol, I'm not going to the bar. How can I go to the bar if I just prayed that God would protect me from the bar? Right? If I'm praying, oh God, help me with my, with my girlfriend, I'm not going to sit on the couch watching Netflix after midnight. Somebody say amen. Fire for the fireplace. It's wonderful in marriage. So much destruction comes in. Oh God, would you protect me? And the more I pray, oh God, would you protect me from the poison, the fewer stupid choices I seem to make, and then next, I won't lead others into it. I start to get a vision, God, that you would break the generational sin because I know what I'm dealing with, and I know the DNA I've passed down to my kids, and I certainly want to see a break in, in, in generational sin. Aren't these brilliant things? Ooh, Jesus knows what he's doing. Isn't it funny? Jesus does this with us. Like, you've got an enemy, and you know what he tells you to do? He doesn't give you a three-hour seminar on how to love your enemy better. He says, pray for your enemy. Just gives you a simple action. I love that. You don't have to be super spiritually mature or insightful or knowledgeable or anything like that. You just have to be obedient and trust him. And when you start to pray for your enemy, he starts to change your heart and you find yourself loving this person because you've been praying for them. And it's the same thing here. You don't have to understand why he says, pray, oh Lord, lead me not into temptation. Just do it and just trust him. It's all been about trust all along. What's your kryptonite? What's hurting you? What's hurting your family? There's so many things, aren't there? Maybe mental health is your kryptonite. And I know that's a hard thing to touch on. And mental health is complex. But some of us struggle. And God's made available 
things to help us. And sometimes isolation has been keeping you into a place. And you need to trust. And you need to give yourself back to community again. And you need to be around people again. You're like, but they hurt me. And that's complex. And I'm not sure I even like people. I get it. I feel that way sometimes myself. Not you, of course, but, you know. But God says, don't give up meeting together like some are in the habit of doing. But all the more as you see the day approaching. That's in Hebrews. And when we isolate, it hurts us. Maybe you got to trust again. But you would say, God, that's my kryptonite. Come and help me, Lord. Maybe your kryptonite is unforgiveness. And maybe you would say, God, I keep replaying the tapes of what they did to me. God, would you protect me from that temptation? Because that's part of what's keeping me in this spot. And God, I keep making speeches in my head. Do you ever make speeches in your head toward them? Boy, you really tell them off, don't you? And you're brilliant when you do it. So am I. God, protect me from those temptations because those are the things that are keeping me in a place. And it goes on and on and on. See, Jesus has good things for you in this life. Would you stand right now? He loves you. He doesn't want you to live in your kryptonite. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you that your word sets us free. Your word is so so clear and it's so good. Words you spoke thousands of years ago. And here they are with us today. And you're still changing us with them today. One of the things I love about you, Jesus, is that not only did you die for us and you secured our eternity, you gave us a clean slate, but you also cared about our life and you cared about how we live You care about our pain. You care about the poison. Thank you for caring about the poison. Help us to trust you in our prayer life. I ask God for this congregation, even the ones watching online right now, that you would build a new discipline into our prayer life, that we would trust you in this, and we would start asking you to protect us from these things that drag us down. Thank you for loving us so well. In Christ's name, amen.